Your daughter walks like a horse. <laughs> I'll never forget those words for as long as I live. I was six years old and at my very first ballet recital. <laughs> we had just finished performing and the uh, teacher was speaking to the parents in the audience and telling them how talented each of their sons or daughters were. Then she looked out into the audience and she said, is Vicky's mom here? And my mother sheepishly put up her hand and she said, your daughter walks like a horse. <laughs> now I remember at six years old being so totally horrified and not quite sure on how to handle the whole situation. So I did the only thing I could think of doing. I walked up to that teacher, I put my hands on my hips, I said, oh yeah, well if I walk like a horse, then it's a beautiful white stallion. <laughs> And I ran out of that gymnasium and I never went back to dance. Now, I know I may never have been a prima ballerina, but who knows what I could have accomplished if that teacher had have given me half a chance. So instead, I headed out into the world to find a place where I could excel. And I was all full of ideas and I wanted to be physically active. I knew that was one thing that I wanted to do. And so I joined my local Y and I remember going into the gym and it always seemed to happen the same way. You walk into a gym with a group of friends and then you've got a teacher or a coach and they choose team captains. So the team captains choose the team. So you have a team captain here, a team captain there, a team forms there, a team forms there, and there's always one kid left standing in the middle at the end that nobody wants on their team. That was me. <laughs> no one ever wanted me on their team because they knew that if I was on their team, I was gonna mess up and our team would end up losing. Well, it used to drive me crazy, but I kept on saying someday it's gonna change, someday it's gonna work, someday, it never happened, but it kept me searching. It kept me searching for things where I could excel. And I tried different things. I finally, finally found competitive swimming, and I loved competitive swimming, but competitive swimming led me to the marathon swimming world. And I'll never, remember, never forget the moment when I first thought of marathon swimming. I was sound asleep in bed, and I woke up with a start, and I had two words running through my head marathon swimming, and I instantly knew it was right. I got out of bed, I turned on my light, I pulled my Guinness Book of World Records off my bookshelf, turned past competitive swimming, and there was all these marathon swimming records. And I looked at that book, and I read those records over and over again all night long. When I got up the next morning, I went to school and I told my friends that someday I was going to be a great marathon swimmer. Well, five years later, I was still, you know, saying, you know, someday. <laughs> it's amazing how when we don't know how to take that first step, that first step always seems to be the hardest one. And when I finally took the first step towards achieving my goals, all of a sudden they started to fall into place one after another after another. I swam 12 miles butterfly. I swam for five and a half days in a pool. I faced sharks in the Catalina Channel. I faced uh, water temperatures of 7 to 10 degrees Celsius in the Juan de Fuca, and I ran into my share of jellyfish in the English Channel. And I had all these different opportunities and experiences, and I started to learn all sorts of different lessons also. And one of the things that I learned is you have to create your own reality. And it's interesting because a lot of the different speakers throughout the day have talked about this in different ways. I made t-shirts, and I'm going, you stole my line! <laughs> But I would create logos, I would create t-shirts, I would put maps on my wall of what I wanted to achieve. I would put little inspirational sayings all around them. I would talk to myself over and over again. I was a lifeguard, I would sit in the lifeguard chair chanting to myself, I can do this, I can do this. My whole life became focused on this one thing of achieving things. And what I realized is what I was doing is I was creating my own reality. The experts would tell me the things that I was achieving were impossible. The average person on the street would just shake their head. But I was creating my own reality. I was creating what I believed was possible. And that's why I believe I was successful in the marathon swims that I did. But as I finished off my marathon swimming career, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to give back. And one of the things I wanted to do was coach. And one of the first people that I ever had the opportunity to meet and work with was a young woman named Ashley Cowan. And Ashley Cowan was born able-bodied. When she was two and a half years old, she got sick. Her mother took her to the hospital. The doctor said there's nothing wrong with her. Take her home. 
The mother knew something was wrong with her little girl, and somebody else realized that her mom was in a panic, and they said, look, I'll help you. And they took her to another hospital. The doctors there diagnosed meningitis, but they couldn't treat her there. And they put her in an ambulance, and they raced her off to Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. Ashley died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. They were able to, able to revive her, but they had to amputate her arms and her legs to save her life. And she lay in a hospital bed for two weeks after that, in a coma, and her mother had been told by the doctors that they didn't think it was fair that she kept her daughter alive, that they didn't think that she was going to have any quality of life. And her mother finally made the decision that they were right, and she went into her daughter's hospital room to wait for the, the preacher to come, to wait for the doctors to come, and she couldn't stand the silence in the room, so she turned on the TV set, and Sesame Street was on, and Ashley turned her head and started to watch TV. Two weeks later, she said, give me my shoes, I want to go home. <laughs> they had a little discussing to do there. I met Ashley when she was eight years old. She walked onto the pool deck where I was coaching with a hundred dollars tucked in the crook of her elbow to give to me because she wanted to swim a lake just like I could. And I looked at this little girl and I'm going, what do you say to a girl like this? What are the chances of somebody with this level of disability could actually swim across a lake? And I said, well, I don't believe in the word impossible, so let's see what you can do. So she climbs into the water, she swings her arms like crazy, gets about half the length of the pool, and is totally and completely exhausted. And I'm going, holy cow, what do I say to her? She wants to swim across the lake, she can't swim the length of the pool. And I pull myself back and I say, nothing is impossible. So I said, you know what, Ashley, we're going to see what you're able to accomplish. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you in this group, you can swim with this instructor, and uh, we'll get you swimming. And so she swam with that swimmer, or with that coach, for two weeks. And then one day she walked onto my pool deck. Okay, let's rephrase that. She stomped onto my pool deck. And if you don't think a little girl missing her arms and legs can stomp, you should see this kid. She stomps onto my pool deck. She comes in, she goes, what do I have to do to swim in your group? I said, Ashley, I've explained this to you. When you can swim eight lengths of the pool continuously, with flip turns, then you can swim in my group. Fine. She stomps over to the edge of the pool, dives in, swims eight lengths of the pool, continuously gets out and says, now can I swim in your group? <laughs> I said, if you keep on swimming like that, you sure can. At nine years old, she qualified for nationals. At 15 years old, she missed the Paralympics by two-tenths of a second. And I looked over at this little girl, and I thought, it's time. She's ready. She can do this. And I went back to her, and I said, do you remember why you joined the swim team? And she said, yes. And we talked about it a little bit, and we decided it was time. And we decided that what she was going to do was swim across Lake Erie, 20 kilometers across Lake Erie. So we trained for a year. We got to the start of the swim. This picture was actually taken at the start of the swim. You can notice the crowds around. <laughs> Nobody believed it was possible. Nobody believed it, and they also were embarrassed that we were going to even put her in there because they thought that this was an embarrassment because there was no way this little girl could do this. I asked one of our friends to come. He was a media person, and he came down and caught the footage of the beginning of the swim, and there was three people that came to watch the beginning as well as our crew of about 20 people. She climbed into the water and started to swim. Halfway across, people started realizing we weren't nuts. <laughs> Halfway across, they started to realize that this was something that was possible. Halfway across, the helicopters start coming in with the media so that they can videotape history in the making. Two miles from shore, Ashley looks up at me and goes, I don't want to do this anymore, pull me out! <laughs> And I looked at her, I said, Ashley, you can do this, you're almost there, you're lying, she says, you're lying, pull me out. And I'm looking at her going, what do I do? She's less than two miles from completion, what am I going to do? And then I looked at her again and realized, every time she said, pull me out, she took another stroke forward. <laughs> Not once did she reach over and try and touch the kayak. And she knew the rules were, if she touched the kayak, she was immediately out of the water, the swim was over. And I realized what she was telling me was she was uncomfortable, 
She didn't actually want to be in the lake anymore, but she wasn't ready to give up. And so we yelled and screamed and cajoled and cheered for the next two hours. 800 meters from shore, she finally figures out we're not lying to her. She's almost there. <laughs> she can hear the people calling out to her. She puts her face in the water and whips to shore, walks up to shore to hundreds and hundreds of people standing there. The media surrounded her. Her story went across Canada, top story. It went around North America. CNN picked it up and went top story around the world on CNN. In 15 hours, one little girl had changed the way everybody thought of the word impossible. What an amazing young lady. I believe in big, hairy, audacious goals. Not those little ones that you set here and then you achieve it, and then you set one here and you achieve it, and you set... I like them way up here. And even if you only get this far, you know that you were closer, and you know you achieved a lot more than you would have been able to. And what are the chances that just maybe, if you didn't achieve it, you might, be able to, you might have got enough information that you can help somebody else achieve that goal. And that's become one of the most important things to me is coaching and helping other people achieve their goals. And I work with a group of young people in Kingston. It's called the Kingston Y Penguins. And we started out as four kids on a swim team without a pool. I started the swim team before we had access to a pool. <laughs> By the end of that year, we had eight kids in a pool. Four lane, 20 uh, yard pool, but we had them in the pool. Today, we have four world-class athletes on the team. We have a pile of them that made national standards. A lot of them are making provincials and regional standards, but we also have little kids who are learning how to take their first strokes. And what I started to realize was these kids needed something more. They're training in a 20-yard in a pool, they needed something more. They needed people to see their possibilities. And so I decided five years ago that I was gonna come out of swimming retirement and do one last marathon swim create my own reality, I came up with a slogan, it was called the Million Dollar Marathon. I had raised $800,000, if I could raise $200,000 more, that would give us a good start towards a pool. Decided I'd swim 80 kilometers butterfly across Lake Ontario. Start in Sackets Harbor, New York, swim to Kingston. Get in the water after a year of training, start to swim. Beautiful, perfect, flat water for the first half hour. Then we pulled out of the harbor. <laughs> Within about three minutes, 17 of our 24 crew members was violently ill. At three o'clock in the morning, I'm swimming along doing my butterfly. The waves are three meters high. There's a chop on top of that. I'm feeling incredibly nauseous. I know I'm not making any progress. And at that moment in time, I know that swim is not going to happen. I also know that the worst time to make a life-altering decision is when you're at your emotional lowest. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was not willing to give up and to quit because I knew I would question myself afterwards. So I kept on swimming until the sun rose. And when the sun rose and I could see the, the waves and I could see the chop on top and I was th vomiting throughout the whole last three hours, and I looked at the kayakers who couldn't keep the kayak beside me and the powerboats that were struggling, and I talked to the navigators um, and asked their opinion on what they thought. They said, no, we think you should be out of the water. We don't think we, we're going to be able to do anything with this swim. So they gathered the boats together, got the towels ready so I could get out of the water. And that took about 10 minutes. And in that 10 minutes, my mind was racing. How can I fix this? How can I fix this? How can I raise this money? By the time they pull, were pulling me onto the Zodiac, I looked up at them and said, I have a solution. <laughs> And a week and a half later, we were climbing back into Lake Ontario. And what I'd done is I'd just changed the route a little bit. We were still in Lake Ontario, we are still doing 80 kilometers, but the boats were following the shoreline. And because the boats were following the shoreline, we had a safer swim. I swam that day, perfectly fat, flat water. When the sun set, the winds picked up, the opposite of what's supposed to happen. One point at night, I swam for four hours in one spot and never actually made any progress forward. By the time 36 hours rolled around, I was about 12 hours behind schedule. At 48 hours in, at which point I thought I was going to be finished my swim, I still had a long way to go. I readjusted my goal. I said my goal is to be out before the sun sets because when the sun sets on Lake Ontario, 
the third night in the water, your hallucinations become crazy, you shiver uncontrollably, uh, you can't hold your food down. I kept on swimming, the sun set, and I wasn't quite there. And I remember just struggling with every ounce of my energy and being able to draw strength from the young people who were cheering for me, from the people standing on the shore, from the people on the boats. And the only reason sometimes I was successful was because they were there supporting me. It wasn't me in the water, it was a whole group of us working together. I readjusted my goal again. I have to be out by midnight. At 11 o'clock, my husband John calls to me, touch the rock, you've done it, touch the rock. And I remember touching the rock and curling up into a little ball and just starting to cry. Then I stood up, and my crew was there, and my swimmers were there, and the media were there. And I talked to the media, and I hugged my kids. We headed off to the hotel for a good night's sleep. For the next following week, if I closed my eyes for longer than a blink, I was immediately into REM activity. It took physically two months for my body to get back to what I consider normal in me. It was an exhausting experience, but it was also an amazing experience. And was it worth it? Over a million bucks, you bet it was. <laughs> you know, I think back to that day that that ballet teacher told me that I walked like a horse. She had no right to make such an awful negative comment. You can affect people's lives so much better with a positive comment than a negative one. You cannot accept the limitations that other people put on you. You have to be able to find your own reality and create your own reality. You have to be able to set your big, hairy, audacious goals. You have to make good decisions for yourself. Because when you do these things, you begin to understand that anything is possible. Our goals and dreams are within our reach. If only we have the courage and the determination and the dedication to pursue them.